we are live now yeah thank you so good evening and welcome you all for this evening the apa icp post graduate virtual training program we have with us uh, dr pallepan sir the national vice president state secretary and welcome you sir for this evening and thank you for having this type of program organized by you and we have with us dr akita madam professor of medicine from kanmal college welcome you madam for this evening and to be the faculty for this evening and we have dr nandrajan sir the professor in adda department of cardiology from kanmal college thank you sir and welcome you sir for this evening to be the faculty Thanks. to discuss the first case of this evening we have with us dr sasitra the final year post graduate is going to discuss a case of valvular heart disease and second session is going to be once again the faculty is going to be dr kita madam followed by the associate professor of respiratory medicine or tb medicine with us dr jay kumar of kanmal college welcome you sir for this evening and that case is going to be discussed or presented by dr fasna so first i request dr sasitra to present the case and requesting the faculties for this first session dr geeta madam and dr nandrajan sir to take over the further proceedings of this evening thank you yeah before before that uh, saranan uh, yes, good evening to everyone on behalf of south zone and south mid zonal apa icp pg master class we are conducting this program every tuesdays for the benefit of the post graduate students for the exam sake as well as practice sake since 4 years we are conducting the program this program is actually live um, across india so pan india post graduate students and dependency students are watching and we are sharing the uh, the link the delegate link more than 3000 people across india so all the post graduate students are watching across india so i am proud to uh, see my my own college professors uh, dr geeta my dear friend dr geeta my classmate in uh, md general medicine in coimbatore medical college we did md general medicine between 1996 to 99 i am proud to see my friend dr geeta our heartiest welcome to dr geeta and my dear friend dr nambirajan sir he is my immediate senior in post graduate uh, uh, post graduate md general medicine and uh, my close friend dr nambirajan sir now i am seeing him as a hod and professor of uh, cardiology in my own paymathur medical college so every week we are discussing various cases so this week we are discussing on a case of valvular heart disease and a case of hydro pneumothorax so nowadays nowadays these two cases not only exam shake but for the practice sake also it's very important all the physicians as a complete physician after completing the general medicine you should learn uh, echocardiogram also it's very important to learn echocardiography i am doing the echocardiography from 2006 so almost 18 years i am doing the echocardiography you also should be trained as a complete physician because to assess the any emergency patient emergency echo emergency ultrasound all the things you should know to practice especially in the periphery area rural area to get, get a complete diagnosis and plan your um, plan your strategies so especially in the valvular heart disease the acute mr so post mi patient acute mr if you detect mortality is poor acute mr rupture of wall wall lead on to the massive pericardial effusion hemopericardium all the things you should know so by learning various echo the valvular heart disease whether mitral valve heart disease or aortic valve heart disease at tricuspid valve and pulmonary valve the two important thing in an acute emergency acute mr or acute ar acute ar or acute tr acute tr always you have to keep it in a mind acute pulmonary embolism so acute pulmonary embolism or arv dilatation usually there but acute tr following pulmonary embolism you may not see mm, i will may not see immediately rrb dilatation rrb dilatation but the tr will be there and copd patient to assess the thing for pulmonary always tr will be there so always you should learn how to diagnose all this valvular heart disease 
and many rural area patients, mitral heart disease, mitral stenosis, and acute AR, especially acute AR, infective endocarditis, you have to suspect. So you have to keep it in mind. Mind as a clinician, you should diagnose the <clears throat> by various cardiovascular examination, valvular heart disease, whether it's there, whether it's a mild, moderate, severe. According to that, you have to plan and submit them for various investigation and manage. So depends upon various things. Um, you have to management will be different. And in case of hydronemothorax, hydronemothorax, especially trauma patient from the fall from the height, especially hemonemothorax will be there many times. You may miss hemonemothorax, sudden collapse can occur. So how to diagnose clinically, clinically by history, general examination and various inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation, all the thing you should be well versed. As a clinician only, as a complete doctor, you can practice in a rural area and you can come to a diagnosis and you can save the patient. By this introduction, uh, I hand over the mic to the, <coughs> the faculties of today, the HOD Medicine Professor Dr. K. Sivakumar and Professor Dr. T. Geeta and Speciality Department from my dear friend Dr. Nambirajan and Dr. J. J. Kumar. Over to Dr. Saravanan. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Saranan, he can take over. Madam, Madam, please uh, take over for the proceedings. Madam, can you hear me? Hi, ah, yes, Saranan. Please, yes, please go ahead, Madam. Ask Sushitra to present the case and start the presentation. Sushitra, you can start the presentation. Yes, okay. Good evening, respected sirs and madam. Myself, Dr. Sushitra, final year postgraduate from Coimbatore Medical College Hospital. I am going to present a valvular heart disease residing in Pollachi who studied up to ITI diploma, came with complaints of fever with bilateral knee joint pain for the past three months. History of presenting illness, patient was apparently in the normal state of health three months back, after which she developed a fever which is low grade, intermittent, not associated with the vomiting, loose stools or burning exudation. Our chills with rigor, our evening rise of temperature, our sore throat, which is relieved by antipyretics, no aggravating or relieving factors. Complaints of bilateral knee joint pain for the past three months, which is symmetrical, migratory, associated with the mild joint swelling and tenderness, not associated with the morning stiffness. She also complains of easy fatigability present for the past three months. Just a minute, uh, Sashidra. Uh, just go back to the previous slide. She has had bilateral knee joint pain for three months. You are yes, stating it is migratory. Yes, Where did it migrate to? Ma'am, it uh, migrates from one knee joint to the another knee joint, ma'am. Before migrating, the first uh, involved, the right knee joint is first involved, followed by the left, left knee joint, ma'am. The right knee joint completely, the pain... What completely, is the duration of the pain? Totally three months, ma'am. How long is the duration of pain? Master. When it has been in a single job. No, no, it is a total period of three three months. Yes, During yes. each episode, how long does the pain last in a particular joint? Mama, she couldn't take the question. Ma'am, but uh, around the uh, so you stated days, that it was migratory. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. What is the importance of migratory joint pain? So migratory joint, a migratory joint pain usually seen in case of uh, rheumatic fever and then uh, vi so viral infections also that will be in the uh, migratory joint pain. So How do you describe the, exactly the rheumatic migratory uh, joint pain? So in migratory, uh, in migratory so treating, polyamide... treating joint pain, you, you have treating joint pain, it involves for one or two weeks in each joint. For example, it might start in an elbow and then it will move on to the knee joint and the, from the right side to the left. It could be a pleating as well as a migratory joint pain. Okay. Before involving the next joint, there will be complete resolving of the initial previous. How many, how many weeks uh, it might last in uh, each oh. joint? That was Madam's question. Usually three weeks. Yes. Oh. No, no. Have you got the history here when you have stated that it is migratory? You must find out the duration of the pain in that joint mm -hmm. and whether it completely resolved before it went to the next joint 
and it seems very unusual that it has only stayed between these two joints. So you must have got a bit more of detailed history when you have asked about this migratory status of the pain. And as Nambirajan Stursar has told, we have always characteristically described this kind of a migratory pain as splitting and pleating. So did this pain fit into these characteristics? Ma'am, partially it is fitting, ma'am. Uh, okay. She is not typically telling that migrated pain because it is only in one the joint pain only, ma'am. Knee joint only, ma'am. Other joints are not involved. All right, proceed. But you must get this history properly if you are uh, stating that it is migratory. Okay. okay. Asitra, that's very important. Okay. Actually, okay. three months duration you are telling. Usually, 5 to 15 years, it's very common. Okay. okay. Migratory okay. polyarthritis. How they will bring the patient? They will, the, for example, seven years old boy or girl, they cannot be able to walk at all. They will carry the patient, that type of severe pain and tenderness. Today, the patient will have the knee joint pain. Tomorrow, the next knee joint and angle joint. Okay, it's migratory. Completely, it will resolve without treatment, just bed rest. Okay, so three months duration, pain. For example, I will think in terms of for example, three months duration, more than three months duration, I will think some terms of rheumatoid arthritis rather than rheumatic fever. Okay. okay. If you say it's a symmetrical, symmetrical migratory. Okay. Usually, Large giant involvement here is symmetrical word, but it is unusual, but usually migratory polyarthritis. Okay, fever and chills will be there. And chest pain, chest pain, palpitation, cordaid, pan cordaid is maybe there. Okay, all the things you'll be having. So, in detail, you should have the elicit the history. Three months, duration of the knee joint pain, three months in between, absolutely normal. Again, getting like that. Okay. okay. Not typically migratory polyarthritis. It's not fit into that word. The patient is having okay. bilateral. Knee joint, both knee joint pain for three months duration, whether it's intermittent, no detail history. Okay. okay Proceed. Complaints of easy criticality present for the past three months. A history of breathing difficulty present for the past three months, which is gradual in onset, progressed from NIHA class, class two to class three. Uh, within a period of three months, no aggravating or relieving factor, not associated with the paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And orthopnea. History of palpitations present for the past three months, which is intermittent, regular, which occur and resolve spontaneously, associated with the retrosternal pricking type of chest pain, associated with the dizziness, and no aggravating or relieving factors. History of loss of weight present, she lost around 12 kg in the last three months. No history of cough with expectation or hemoptysis. No history of loss of consciousness. No history of swelling of legs or abdominal distension. No history of facial puffiness or reduced urine output or cola colored urine. No history of sore throat skin what rashes. What are the causes of cola colored urine? Um, she presented what is cola colored urine? Dark colored, dark, brown, magenta colored uh -huh. urine. First describe what colored. Magenta colored. It is cola colored. Yes. Can you name one spe specific example where we use this term cola colored urine? Well, in hematuria, we usually ask... Why have you a, asked that question? A patient presented with a fever with a joint pain, ma'am, associated with the breathing okay. difficulty. A fever with joint pain, one of the causes okay. may be an, a, a renal involvement, nephritis could be there, ma'am. So, I try to rule out that condition. Fever with joint pain, you want to think of nephritis. Any auto... auto that fever with joint pain, pain, you want to consider... Now, no, listen to the question and answer. Now, fever with joint pain is how do you equate it with nephritis and therefore cola colored urine? I mean, post step you mean the reason why you have a cola colored urine? What is it pathologically that causes that cola color? Is it a hemolysis? A rhabdomyolysis? Can you Maybe have it? Yes, ma'am. Ah. So hemolysis so you give a specific answer. answer to that question. So in this case, did you expect uh -huh. a cola colored urine? Okay, continue. Okay. And define P and D. So define P and D. Yeah. So nocturnal dyspnea is the dyspnea occurs during REM sleep, sir, in which the patient awakens during uh, from the sleep. It usually occurs 
one to uh, two hours after the onset of the sleep and the patient uh, assumes recovery after obtaining the upright posture after 10 to 30 minutes of upright posture sir it is due to it is indicating the severe left ventricular failure uh, it is because of the one lying down posture there will be a shift of uh, due to increased venous return there will be a shift of fluid from the intravascular space uh, in, interstitial space to the intravascular space which is leading to pulmonary edema and then on lying down there will be an elevation of uh, diaphragm which is decreasing the vital capacity of that patient and then during sleep there will be an uh, decreased sympathetic drive to the left ventricle which is also okay. causing paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea okay define anginal chest pain typical anginal chest pain uh, first one is the site uh, first one is onset is usually in the sudden onset in origin and then site it is retrosternal and then it is usually radiating to the left and right shoulders neck and then back of the shoulder back uh, it is associated with the vomiting diaphoresis palpitations even syncope um, are, are relieved by nitrates not relieved by PPAs. Duration and uh, how, how long it will last? Duration of the chest pain. Typical uh, chest pain. 15 to 30 minutes. Okay, relieved by taking rest. Relieved by taking pain. rest and nitrates. It may radiate up to the lower jaw. Even okay. they may present with the dental root pain. Okay, up to umbilicus. Okay, back shoulder pain, scapular pain. They may present various type, okay? Angina variants. Okay. okay. Nambirajan, sir, you can elaborate. Yeah, yes, yes. She was presenting letter complete. Uh, have you completed the history? Yes, so, not if so, you can summarize your uh, history and uh, tell us uh, what is the uh, chamber involved? Uh, is it a heart disease? Which side of the heart is whether it is an inflow or outflow. So, with the finding predominant, finding was fever with joint pain. Joint and you pain. have a breathlessness class 2 to 3 and yes, yes. palpitations. What, what do you mean by palpitations with regard to uh, cardiovascular system? Uh, so, palpitations is the abnormal awareness of the one's own heartbeat due to change in the rate, rhythm, and contractions. Uh, in Cardiovascular system, the palpitations is mainly due to, in case of high cardiac output status, such as anemia, uh, high pyrexias, and then uh, thyrotoxicosis, then Asitra, high output status, such in as... cardiology, when you say palpitation, the first thing you should... You yeah, should arrhythmia should come into your mind, okay. first and foremost thing. The next thing, you are going to discuss a valvular heart disease. So, in that situation, what do you expect? There is like high output status, such as mitral regurgitation. Polymoverloaded status, like regurgitant lesions, like yeah. aortic regurgitation or yes, mitral regurgitation. Okay. You said some dyspnea. Uh, uh, what is the, what is orthopnea? Sarva uh, asking uh, PNB. So you tell me what is orthopnea? The patient develops a breathing sudden, uh, immediate breathing difficulty on attaining the lying down posture. Sir. The patient develops dyspnea within one to two minutes of attaining the lying posture, and the dyspnea results after uprighting, uh, after assuming the upright posture within two, one to two minutes itself. Sir. Okay, very good. What does this PND and orthopnea imply in cardiovascular system? What does it tell you? You yes. said it was a sign of left ventricle. No, it's not that. You try to interpret in a different way. What does it tell you exactly? PND and orthopnea. PND, what does it imply in a cardiovascular system? Increased cap, uh, pulmonary capillary which pressure is it, 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 It's due to pulmonary, it, it tells us pulmonary venous hypertension. Okay. It's due to the, uh, it could be due to increased LA pressure due to mitral stenosis, that is inflow obstructions. Or it could be due to other left heart diseases, simply like uh, your hypertension, myocarditis, pericarditis, and other things. Okay. Okay, yes. proceed. No history of sore throat. Lesion in the mitral wall. Okay, any obstructive lesions. Or uh, rightly pointed out, usually pulmonary arterial hypertension you will hurt, but here you have to use pulmonary venous hypertension. Okay. 
no history of sore throat or skin rashes or involuntary movements no history of voice teams or difficulty in swallowing no history of any cyanotic spells or recurrent respiratory tract infections no history of any dental procedures or iv drug abuse what skin rashes or what skin changes you expect in a rheumatic fever uh, ma'am usually it is associated with the erythema marginatum and then uh, in okay. case of uh, in case of mitral stenosis there will be mitral phases will be there ma'am and then uh, uh, no, i asked only rheumatic fever erythema marginatum subcutaneous nodules yes ma'am skin over the skin there okay. will be subcutaneous, subcutaneous nodules. nodules okay Yes. Past history. At her 10 years Continue. of age, patient had a similar history of fever with bilateral knee joint pain for the period of one week. The joint pain was very severe in intensity in such a way that she couldn't able to move her limbs and couldn't able to do her daily activities. For which the patient got treatment in the nearby hospital as an outpatient. Patient symptoms relieved with the medical management. No history of any underlying heart disease detected at that time and no prophylaxis. Was she advised injection penicillin at that time? Oh, was, she no prophylaxis was she advised injection? Have you asked that history? Yes, ma'am. I asked, ma'am. Uh, she told that uh, she doesn't know the condition. She doesn't have any heart disease at that time. And she doesn't uh, advise to get the, any uh, prophylactic injection, ma'am. No, she was just 10 years old. Did you get the history from the mother? Yes, ma'am. Okay. How many percentage of rheumatic fever presents without any history of uh, sore throat? 50 percentage. Uh, More than 50 of, percent of rheumatic fever. Not recollected. Uh, history. Okay. And how long does it take after sore throat for the development of rheumatic fever? Um, a latent period of one to two weeks, approximately three yes. weeks. Yes, four it takes a few weeks. weeks. Yes, four to six weeks. Yes. The fever will subside in four to six weeks. Okay. Okay. After which yes. patient is apparently in the normal state of health till the presenting complaints. Not a known case of systemic hypertension or diabetes mellitus, tuberculosis, asthma or epilepsy or thyroid okay, disorder. Could you tell us some differential diagnosis for migratory polyarthritis? Uh, for migratory polyarthritis, one, uh, viral fevers things such as dengue, chikungunya and then rheumatic fever and then uh, um, even enteric fever also there will be a uh, migratory polyarthritis then Lyme's disease mm. Gonococci, uh, meningococci yes, SLE yes. even uh, rheumatic causes as what is post, post uh, streptococcal reactive arthritis how will you differentiate from this uh, sorry in post streptococcal reactive arthritis, there will be a short latent period will be there. So it will be usually uh, between one to two weeks uh, the, be, uh, between the occurrence of the fever and the arthritis, uh, gas infection and arthritis, and there will be a poor response to the NSAIDs will good. be there. Very good. Small joints will be involved. Yes, and, and then that small that joints are predominantly involved in the post streptococcal so it reactive. Won't, uh, it will not subside spontaneously and no response to, as you said, the NSAIDs. That is an important point. Very good. Okay. Could you tell the mechanism of rheumatic fever causing the thyroiditis? What is the basic mechanism? Uh, sir, it is an autoimmune. Uh, it is an autoimmune reaction that is based on the molecular mimicry, sir, in which antibodies produced against the uh, group A beta hemolytic streptococci is attacking the uh, walls of the endocardium, sir, mainly against the uh, M proteins, uh, group A. Carbo carbohydrates and M proteins and then cardiac myosins. Yes, the grass reactivity yes, of the antigen and the antibodies. Okay. Which are the strains which are more prone for this among the beta hemolytic streptococci? Uh, M type strains are mainly 8, 9, uh, 8, 3, 4, 18, 19, and then 24. Okay, okay, okay. Right. What are the clinical features of rheumatic carditis? Um, patient complaints of breathing difficulty. It leads to acute uh, mitral regurgitation. Now. So there will be an patient may be present with uh, failure, heart failure, and uh, complaints of uh, exertional dyspnea or uh, uh, palpitations. Um, you mentioned about involuntary movements. What did you expect and when? 
uh, usually it occurs late in rheumatic fever ma'am uh, that is sindenham's chorea is co- is seen in rheumatic fever it is a late manifestation no, of rheumatic fever it doesn't occur with rheumatic fever it is not associated with rheumatic fever if i am right i think if i am wrong dr namirajan should correct me it, it, it heart... after 6 months it's a late uh, manifestation it's a late manifestation oh, yeah. and also i don't think it manifests when a patient has developed an established rheumatic heart disease am i right dr namira ji yeah, yes 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 ma'am yes. oh. don't so because she has asked for history of sore throat history of involuntary movements because they don't get associated with an established case of rheumatic heart disease they are all features which happen at different periods of time i think you must essentially be aware of that that is the reason why i am telling all these things okay okay yes. continue yes. ma'am continue uh, she was born from non consanguineous marriage following normal vaginal delivery her postnatal period was uneventful no history of any nic you stay no, no, no. postnatal period is for the mother not for her postnatal antenatal period and postnatal period uneventful okay doesn't okay. matter continue so major neonatal illness the family history she was living with his father and mother her younger brother died at his uh, 22 years of age due to a road traffic accident elder and younger sisters were in normal state of health no history of any sudden cardiac death in her family she belongs to lower middle class family if there Person- had been a sudden cardiac death in her family if there had been sudden cardiac death in her family what do you think could be the cause and its relationship to her presenting condition uh Um, uh, sudden cardiac death in her family usually uh, we have signifies a, a presence of head shows in hypertrophic obstructive okay. cardiomyopathy cardiomyopathy hmm. so anything else pre excitation syndromes prolonged qt interval gugada 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 i think it is more to the male family members because she is a female maybe prolonged qt syndromes is something that needs to be thought of the excitation the importance of overcrowding in rheumatic uh, when do you say it is overcrowded how many persons living in a room uh, if male and female are then more than 9 years of age they should be separated uh, separated in a separate they should be living in a separate room so here they are living in the same room only sir and then per person there should be a square more than 90 square feet area is needed for one person to live sir it is also that is overcrowding is also here sir in this uh, girl family okay okay ma'am thank you a personal history she is a mixed diet consumer not taking alcohol uh, normal sleep pattern no, normal bowel and bladder habits her menstrual history was normal a summary a 33 year old female patient came with fever with bilateral knee joint pain at the naiha class 2 to class 3 shortness of breath easy fatigability palpitations associated with the chest pain and dizziness with a significant weight loss and with a past history of fever with bilateral knee joint pain at her 10 years of age a case a case of recurrent rheumatic fever with acquired valvular heart disease probably a left stenotic lesions there cannot be any other differential diagnosis here except for uh, acquired valvular heart disease what is the natural history of the mitral stenosis when will they become symptomatic after they how many years present. of uh... they usually present in the early stage one means because of the uh, usually the la pressure won't uh, uh, won't compensate that much so so they they present in the early it will take 2 to 3 decades yes. normally it is a slow process of increased la pressure and uh, your development of pulmonary hypertension pnd and other things so in this case uh, there were no clear cut history of rheumatic fever you say recurrent rheumatic fever okay let it be because 50% they won't have the history so uh, any other as madam asked any other possibility apart from valvular heart disease with this uh, complaints can you make any other any uh, infective endocarditis could be a possibility also fever with the joint pain huh. that is also a part of an underlying cardiac disease that is the next step we think of and yes there are a lot of cases of native or endocarditis possibilities any other possibilities 
What was the age of the patient? He now is 23 years of age. Okay, 23 years. Uh, they can have any uh, fever, uh, myocarditis, uh, producing uh, these sort of symptoms. Exactly. Uh, myocarditis is so common now, having uh, fever. after the COVID. Uh, myocarditis yes, yes. can be uh, some... Uh, or if we just remove the rheumatic fever component, because we aren't very sure, still it can be a cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy. Yes. She wasn't. Simple, simple uh, Barlow syndrome, syndrome with the. Not married. Have not mentioned. Not that. married. Not if married. Okay. Oh. Okay. So whenever you are saying okay. some okay. diagnosis, so you should have some uh, differential diagnosis from the history itself. Okay. Right, you proceed. General examination, patient conscious, oriented, a febrile, poorly built, height 155 centimeter, weight 38 kg, BMI 16, arm span height, uh, difference 2 centimeter, upper segment and lower segment. There has been a significant weight loss of 12 kilograms. Okay. Uh, Sashidra, just a minute, ma'am. Okay. Significant weight loss of 12 kilograms over a period of three months. Okay. Why could you not include thyrotoxicosis and its cardiac disease as a possibility in the differential diagnosis? Definitely. Ah. Definitely. Is she a diabetic? No, no, sir. Pulmonary tuberculosis no, ruled out. Then why do you want to insist 12 kg weight loss? So it, it leads into a different. Uh, very, very yeah. heavy. Very true. Okay. Okay. Yes. Upper segment and lower segment ratio pointed, which is normal, no paler, no tick trick, no cyanosis, no clubbing, no pedal edema or lymphadenopathy. JVP is elevated, uh, 5 cm uh, with a prominent A we have seen, no peripheral signs of aortic regurgitation, no joint tenderness or deformities, and no markers of congenital heart disease or rheumatic heart disease or morphonite habitus or infective endocarditis. Uh, fundus of both eyes was normal. Mm -hmm. How did you measure the day? Oh. Okay. How did you measure the JVP? Uh, so we have to make the uh, make the patient on in a supine position. Uh, we have to take two scales, one vertical scale and one horizontal. Supine position. Is it supine position, Sashidra? Ma'am, now it was changed. Even in supine position, we can. What is the position you adapt? Usually, we can uh, see at the 45 degree in ah, the That is the latest bit. Okay. Now, we can even measure in a... So, I think the number number should be the... No, it has been taken out, Madam, number. that uh, reclining 45 okay, okay. degrees is not oh, needed. Oh. We are going to... Uh, okay. Further. So, even flat. Like yeah, yeah. You can okay, see. Okay, okay. okay. Um. Then, we have to see the highest uh, distension of the JVP. Uh, we have to measure the vertical length that, uh, placed at the external angle scales. Uh, usually it comes around 4 to 5 cm uh, and then we have to add uh, 5 cm for uh, measuring the right atrial pressure also, which is a measure of right atrial pressure. Also. Okay. Your when general you examination have... should have included uh, seeing for rough tremors of the hands and you should have looked into the neck for any enlargement of the thyroid gland. I think that's one gross uh, area which is missed out. The young woman, woman with a heavy weight loss, with palpitations, with breathlessness, a possibility of cardiomyopathy, a thyroid toxicosis should have been considered. I think, irrespective of whether she had or not, I think that's one thing that is very much missing in your presentation. Okay. There is no thyromegaly, but I couldn't add here. There is no goiter uh, thyroid swelling and general examination. What are the conditions okay, you, you, you see? A giant A wave, prominent, very prominent A wave. Prominent A wave seen in uh, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, what is the basic pathophysiology of a giant A wave? Uh, Ma'am, A wave is because of the atrial contractions, ma'am. Due to elevated Why right. Giant A wave happen? Uh, because of the elevated right atrial pressure, uh, there will be a prominent A wave will be there. Giant wave. Against a non compliant um, right ventricle. So that's very important. That is why it is giant A wave. 
ஒன்னும் <laughs> respiratory rate 19 per minute thoraku abdominal type uh, temperature 98.6 degree fahrenheit cardiovascular system examination uh, inspection yes. chest wall symmetrical no kyphosis scoliosis or drooping of shoulders trachea appears to be in midline apical impulse seen in the left 6th intercostal space 2.5 cm lateral to midclavicular line pulsation seen in the left 2nd intercostal space close to the sternum no precardial bulge no dilated veins scars or sinuses a uh, palpation tracheal position confirmed to be in midline apical impulse felt in the 6th intercostal space 2.5 cm lateral to the midclavicular line which is hyperdynamic in nature associated with the systolic thrill palpable p2 present uh, associated with the systolic thrill a grade 3 parasternal heat present how do you what, what no, you... just one minute in fact i am uh, to dr nambirajan sir i just want to clarify a doubt patient has a small volume pulse with a small yeah. volume pulse is it possible to have a hyperdynamic character of the apical impulse uh, it's not possible but it could be uh, uh, what was the blood pressure 96 mm hg 96 oh pulse pressure yes 90 no pulse yeah. pressure also okay so it cannot be so that uh, is it right to say that there is a hyperdynamicity because that was one thing that uh, didn't correlate when i was uh, going through the case sheet Okay, what do you mean by uh, grade three parasternal he one p two palpable? What does uh, it indicate? So palpable p two is indicating the pulmonary arterial hypertension or pulmonary uh, arterial dilatation, and then grade three parasternal he is indicating either right ventricular hypertrophy or left atrial enlargement. How do you grade uh, parasternal he? There are three grades. Are there the grade one, grade two, and grade three? In grade one, there will be invisible parasternal. visible parasternal impulses and then uh, grade to visible and palpable uh, and ob not obliterable uh, grade 3 there will be an obliterable okay uh, uh, apical impulse down and uh, out you are saying so what does it indicate the lv is dilated it is shifted uh, left ventricular shifted uh, down and out sir because of maybe lv dilatation and it is also hyperdynamic in nature maybe volume overload lv volume overload which is indicating lv volume overload conditions okay. such as uh, recurrent lesions uh, ar or mr or reflected in the pulse that is my question okay not reflected in the pulse volume um, okay from the condition madam oh, the condition is producing hyperdynamic apical uh, impulse especially volume overload uh, status would have gone in for the status of failure where that can produce okay. change in the pulse volume also the it, failure okay, is not okay, okay. to extend that can produce a, whatever the expected pulse volume including your uh, pulse pressure including systolic diastolic but when it is gone to a status okay. where the chamber is still hyperdynamic or the chamber is dilated hyperdynamic but there is a cardiac impending cardiac failure okay. dilatation has happened to the extent that it is gone for the stage of the disease where failure has happened may not be able because she is trying to say that the patient is having pulmonary venous hypertension and pulmonary congestion paroxysmal nocturnal mm -hmm. dyspnea all those stuff mm -hmm. might be producing a disturbance yeah, yeah. of the cardiac output also it is a basically eccentric hypertrophy okay okay we're okay. going for that yeah thank okay. you madam yeah agree that yes let's go ahead thank you sashidra percussion the right heart border corresponds to the right sternal border and the left heart heart border corresponds to the apex and then percussion over the pulmonary area dull note present um, auscultation uh, mitral area s1 s2 heard loud s1 present a low pitched rough rumbling with diastolic murmur of grade 3 preceded by the opening snap without pre systolic accentuation breast heard over the apex with the bell of the stethoscope with patient in left lateral position with breath held in expiration A high-pitched, soft-blowing pan-systolic murmur of grade four, 
heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope radiating to the axilla and back with patient in left lateral position with the breath held in expiration. Tricuspid area, yes. What is the pre-systolic accentuation represents Ashidra? There is no pre-systolic accentuation here, but what essentially is meant by pre-systolic accentuation and what does it represent? Because of the atrial contraction, the atrial pressure, elevated atrial pressure leading to this. If there is an uh, atrial fibrillation, it will be absent. There will be no pre-systolic accentuation. Patient will complain of palpitations. Here we don't have uh, atrial fibrillation. Yes, ma'am. But uh, here I think the pulse rate is also quite normal. No, there was no atrial yes, fibrillation. Yes, ma'am. I couldn't able to uh, hear ma'am pre-systolic accentuation. Okay. Maybe that pan systolic murmur was very okay. severe in grade. What is, what is that opening snap imply? What is opening snap? Uh, opening snap is indicating the pliability of the valves. It is because of the sudden diastolic buckling of the anterior mitral leaflet due to elevated atrial pressures, either right or left atrial pressures. Uh, it is seen in case of uh, uh, mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, uh, and then uh, VSTs. What is the normal A2OS interval? A2OS interval. Interval normally is around um, 30 to 150 milliseconds. What will happen in uh, severe mitral stenosis? So the, stenosis, the duration of the A2 OS interval will be shortened. Okay. Uh, shortened A2 OS interval. As the disease progresses, as the LA pressure increases, the A2 OS interval will come closer. Okay, it becomes shortened. Okay. What is that band systolic murmur? It's due to radiant into axilla. And back. The pancystolic murmur either due to mitral or uh, tricuspid regurgitant lesion or VST. So in mitral regurgitation, if there is an involvement of the anterior mitral leaflet, uh, it uh, radiates to the axilla and back. So if there is a posterior mitral leaflet involvement, it radiates to the base of the heart. Okay. What are the other causes of pancystolic murmur? In the... so mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, and then uh, VSTs. Can, can, can you clinically differentiate these uh, three types of uh, the diseases which you said? By, uh, and comparing uh, the phases of uh, respiration, you can differentiate. So, in tricuspid regurgitation, the mur uh, intensity of murmur du increases during inspiration. In uh, mitral regurgitation, the duration of uh, the intensity of murmur increases during uh, expiration. So. Okay. What is that? Uh, right side of mom was increased in uh, the inspiration is called as what is that sign what is that sign called carvalas sign have you heard okay sarvas about to ask something sir yes sir yes sir and dr sajitra the murmurs which you are able to appreciate in the mitral area can you please quantify the murmurs of your diastolic component and the systolic component it depends upon the duration of murmurs, mild, moderate, and severe. I'm not asking you, like, what is your patient's quantification? Are you so, going to say it's a moderate, mild? Is grade 3 is loud, without thrill is there, so my mitral area, a diastolic murmur. Pan-systolic murmur is grade 4, so it is heard with the thrilling, sir. So. No, is it the way to grading or not a grading? The quantification is it like a mild, moderate, severe disease. Uh, how, the, how, on... how long this diastolic murmur extend? It uh, extend into the, the duration of the murmur, A to S gap, first one, first one, first one. So, so many factors are there to decide upon, right? Why I'm raising this question is you said the patient's pulse is small volume yes. and the pulse pressure is narrow pulse pressure. And you said the eccentric hypertrophy of the left ventricle mm -hmm. and the hyperdynamic in nature. Mm -hmm. You are able to appreciate the mitral regurgitant as well as stenotic murmur. Mm -hmm. All the findings with the clinical picture of venous hypertension of the pulmonary origin. It's not some, it's, it's, the picture is not completely fitting into the clinical correlation of your symptom and the signs. So, unless you quantify, because you said S1 is loud. And you're able to see the pre-systolic accentuation. Opening snap is audible. So many findings are saying, but it is not completely fitting into 
to say that it is a coexistence of mitral stenosis and mitral degeneration alone unless you quantify and try to give explanation for your clinical features what you are able to appreciate and justify the clinical picture of the symptom of your pulmonary venous hypertension also you able to follow me points yes sir yeah can you please quantify is it a moderate or severe mitral stenosis or which murmur is dominant one here Uh, sir, pants murmur is the dominance and associated with the thrill. So, uh, why, do, why do you say, sir? Why do you say, sir, that? What sir, are the sir, points to say the mitral regurgitation murmur to quantify mild, moderate, severe? Sir, associated with the thrill, sir, and then associated with okay. the hyperdynamic apical impulse. Uh huh. Um, If you think that your MR murmur is severe, it has been associated with the S three. And your loud S one will not be there. Yes. Okay. Uh, you, you should have yes. a S three, uh, and uh, your opening snap will also will not be much appreciated. Okay. Yes. The clinical signs. What you are having is mix up of equal importance to be given mm -hmm. for your mitral valve stenosis as well as regurgitation. In that case, how you are going to explain is a bit of questionable. We have to give explanation at the end of your presentation. Keeping okay. in mind the clinical symptoms as well as the signs, and okay. I ask the question in the exam. You will see the investigation, sir. Uh, slowly. In the examination, in the examination, they are supposed to give explanation for the severity also, sir. Yes, yes. I, I completely agree. Agree. You should say which is dominant lesion, whether the mitral stenosis is a dominant lesion, uh, it's a severe mitral stenosis associated okay. with my moderate uh, mitral regurgitation. Like that, you should be able to quantify. That is what Sir is repeatedly saying. You did not say the diastolic mm -hmm. murmur, which is extending into S one in the face of diastole, is a severe mitral stenosis. So you should quantify each uh, thing. Okay. To go back and start reading about the severity of the individual murmurs, how to quantify, and try to have in a habit of mentioning about the severity of each lesion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go and read about that. That should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Please go there. Tricuspid area, S1, S2 heard by high pitched, soft blowing transistolic murmur of grade three heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope in the left parasternal area. Patient in supine position, breath held in inspiration. Pulmonary area, S1, S2 heard loud B2 present, a crescendo decrease into ejection systolic murmur of grade four is heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope with the patient leaning forward with breath held in inspiration. Aortic area, S1, S2 heard no other sound. Other system examination. Respiratory system normal vesicular breath sounds heard, uh, no added sounds. Uh, per abdomen soft bubble sounds present, no organomegaly or free fluid. Uh, CNS uh, uh, central nervous system examination, no focal neurological deficit. Uh, diagnosis: a case of recurrent rheumatic fever and acquired valvular heart disease of rheumatic etiology in the form of severe mitral regurgitation and severe mitral stenosis. Predominantly severe mitral regurgitation with. Pulmonary hypertension with patient in sinus rhythm and signs of heart failure and without signs of infective endocarditis. So just as uh, both the professors were asking you, you have to quantify and yes, say which of the three lesions you have: mitral regurgitation, you have mitral stenosis, you have tri tricuspid regurgitation. Yes, which of the three is most severe? Here it is a mitral regurgitation. I'm, I'm going towards mitral regurgitation because the patient had a complaints of. Uh, um, Orthopnea uh, had a complaints of breathing difficulty with the uh, palpitations and easy fatigability associated with an examination. There will be an uh, uh, apical impulse is down and out, ma'am. Uh, with the um, down and out apical impulse with the pansystolic murmur of grade uh, four. That's a loud thrill uh, murmur associated with the thrill, ma'am. But then you do not have the classic of. Uh... A water hammer pulse. In fact, you have a yes, very of course that is more true yes. with the regurgitant, dietic regurgitant lesion. Mm -hmm. But that is the reason why I pointed out to that point as well. So whether there is a severity of mitral stenosis or regurgitation is of course you are talking on the basis of the apical impulse, the hyperdynamicity, etc. But considering the other features, mitral stenosis also seems to be very severe. Yes, ma'am. But Normally, the mitral stenosis does not influence the hemodynamics of the mitral regurgitation. Any, any future of mitral stenosis, whether it is severe. But the severity of mitral regurgitation 
definitely will have an impact on the mitral stenosis. So when you have a volume overload, it will definitely have a exaggerated mitral uh, stenosis. Uh, when you have a severe MR, it can have the impact on your clinical features. So in this case, if you would have, uh, uh, if you are able to appreciate the S3 and say it is a, a severe MR, then we can explain your other features of loud S1 and other features. Okay, that is how, madam, it should go. Okay, okay, okay. This can uh, be accepted as a severe MR producing a volume overload and then can exaggerate your findings of the mitral stenosis. Okay. Thanks. And again, S3 is a low pitched sound. Your opening snap is a high pitched sound. High pitched sounds. Okay. That you should be able to appreciate. When you have an opening snap, when you have a uh, diastolic thrill, when you have a diastolic MDM, then it is definitely a mitral stenosis. Okay. So, but here I think she has documented a, a I mean, a regurgitant um, a thrill, rather. So, MR. Yeah, yeah. Grade 4, oh, she's grade saying. Four. Grade Yes. So it could be a dominant. We'll see the investigations how it is going. Uh, because uh, for short of time, we cannot teach her the whole thing how to uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, calculate or how to uh, go for going for a dominant lesion by each and every finding. Uh, yes, that yes. we can learn it later. Next, uh, what is the investigation? ECG, yeah? The investigation ECG and ECG. We will proceed with the investigation such as complete blood count, renal function no, no, test. No, that and all is not mandatory, madam. We'll go with this. Uh, because you mentioned recurrent rheumatic fever, what was the ASO titer? Did it correlate? So, ma'am, ASO titer comes around more than uh, 280 ma'am, torch unit. So, it is correlated with the. For recurrence, what are the parameters you watch in a biochemical to so see a recurrent rheumatic fever? ASO titer and anti DNS B uh, titers. And then elevated ESR and CRPs. That is also mandatory. ECG there have been prolonged PR intervals. Then documentation of fever. Okay. Okay. ECG. No, where is the ECG? I mean, ECG there won't be any uh, mitra, atrial enlargements, ma'am. There will be right axis deviation is there, ma'am, in the ECG. What are the things you expect in this case? Um, uh, in case of uh, both uh, mitral regurgitation is uh, more predominant than mitral stenosis. Ma there will be a left atrial enlargement will be there. Ma so in uh, lead uh, V D two and V one there will be a uh, left left atrial enlargement changes present. Ma in lead two there will be a bifid P wave will be present. Is it present then, here? Because it's very not very clear. No, it is right, only right axis deviation. We repeated many ECTs, ma'am. It is coming. Can you assess the severity of mitral stenosis by seeing a ECG? Um, yes, sir. Presence axis. of LV, tension and LA enlargement. And then presence of right ventricular uh, hypertrophy. How do you assess the right ventricular hypertrophy in uh, ECG? In lead V1, there will be an uh, R wave more than 7 mm. Presence of Ma'am? R greater than S, no? Yes, ma'am. Mm. R wave more than 7 mm. Any other findings? Uh, then uh, there will be an... Uh, Right axis deviation associated with the right ventricular hypertrophy will be there in case of mitral regurgitation. Then yes, in case patient develops atrial fibrillation, then absence of P waves with irregular RR interval yeah. will also be there. Yeah, of course, there is no atrial fibrillation, so yes. we can ignore that. Okay, so your ECG findings aren't very much contributory. Yes, you right do not have an LAE because it's not very clear for me. You do not have an LAE ECG here. ECG is of a very poor quality. Very poor quality, yeah. I know. Yes, ma'am. Same. There, there won't be any right left atrial enlargement. Okay. All right. Ah, X-ray. Um, uh, this is the PA view. Uh, showing the there is, an, uh, there is no cardiomegaly, ma'am. There is a straightening of the uh, left heart borders. Uh, maybe due to left atrial enlargement or uh, pulmonary hypertension. 
Now, is this the way you read on a mitral stenosis X-ray? Chest X-ray PMU of 23-year-old female patient with the normal, uh, no rotation, uh, good penetration. Uh, with the so, when you uh, read uh, any mitral valve disease X-ray, you should say the signs of left atrial enlargement, what are the signs of that? Then you should look for signs of pulmonary venous hypertension. Then you should look for pulmonary arterial hypertension. Okay, like that you should go. Well, is there uh, any evidence of uh, uh, left atrial enlargement in this case, uh, X-ray? There is straightening of left heart border is there. What is that due to? Uh, it is due to uh, either left atrial enlargement or pulmonary artery dilatations. Okay, mainly pulmonary artery dilatation. Pulmonary artery artery pulmonary artery 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 artery. Artery. Okay. Then what are the other features of left atrial enlargement in X-ray? Uh, so there have been double atrial shadow. Uh, shadow and shadow. Okay. Uh, then? Uh, then strengthening of left heart border. If there is a left atrial enlargement leading to left, uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, no, there will be no, no, no. Of... left uh, splaying of carina yes, that you can see. Uh, the, and then the barium swallow, the indentation will be there. Okay, then you see, now you address the signs of pulmonary venous hypertension. What are the four grades of pulmonary venous hypertension? Um, grade 1, what do you call that? Grade 0 to 3, grade 0 usually normal, so 8 to 12. Uh, what would be the radiological appearance? In the... Grade 1, there will be cephalization of uh, Very good. Uh, vessels. Then? Uh, then grade 2, there will be an... Uh, uh, interstitial alveolar edema will be there. So, in grade 3, there will be an interstitial edema. Curly B will be when uh, curly B lines. Where will you look for the curly B lines? The base of the uh, lungs, near the base of the lungs. Base and of lungs means what do you mean? Back wing appearance. That is uh, for, for grade 4. Uh, pulmonary hypertension. What will be the pulmonary artery pressure in the great uh, bad wing appearance? Approximate pulmonary artery. Uh, more than 40. More than 25. 25. Okay. okay. What do you see about the lung fields? Can you comment on the lung fields? Is there any pulmonary artery uh, uh, venous hypertension or not? not no, sir. No pulmonary. Being this hypertension here. There is one the straightening of hot water is there so that to syndicate that is, that is agreed, Dr. Sasitra. Regarding the pulmonary vascular markings, are you able to I see there is a prominent bronchovascular okay. markings? Yes. Both the uh, sides uh, you have a uh, increased uh, bronchovascular markings up yes. to the periphery. The whole lung field uh, is uh, full of uh, increased bronchovascular markings. Okay. Is, is it a left ventricle apex? Uh, left ventricle apex. apex. How do you say a left ventricle apex? Uh, I find it is rounded now. Okay. Left Next investigation you have got anything? Next, uh, then echocardiography, 2D echocardiography. Yes, yes, go to that. That will finally tell us what, where do we stand. You have got the video or only? Only findings are this. Only findings are okay. So read it out. There is no regional wall motion, abno wall motion abnormality. Ejection fraction 58 percentage. AM uh, anterior mitral leaflet and posterior mit mitral leaflet mobility thickened and the PML mobility is restricted. The diastolic doming of AML presence. Okay. What does it indicate? It's indicating oh, the rheumatic etiology of uh, mitral uh, and mitral leaflet involvements. Okay. Only these findings, sir. Uh, uh, yes, very good. Go, go. Next. LA dilatation is there. LA is dilator. Um, 6.1 cross 5.9 centimeter with the mitral valve uh, area by planimetry is 1.5 centimeter square with the mean uh, gradient by pressure gradient is 10 by 22 mm Hg with moderate TR. With the, uh, TRPG is 46 mm Hg. Impression aromatic heart disease with the severe MR, moderate MS, and moderate TR with moderate PAH.
Okay, proceed, Dr. Namita Jansar. Yes, madam. Okay. So, you have mm -hmm. any comments regarding the echocardiographic findings? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, next, next slide. So, you have a dilated left uh, atrium. Uh, next slide, Sasitra. So, the mean gradient is uh, 10. 10. Uh, so, uh, uh, with the moderate TR and TRPG is 46. So, mean gradient of 10 indicates uh, mm -hmm. severe mitral stenosis. Moderate uh, mitral stenosis. Moderate, okay. Yes. And TRPG of 46? Yes, pulmonary, moderate pulmonary hypertension is there. Okay. It is more than uh, 16, we can tell severe pulmonary artery hypertension. Sorry, MR, 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 you did not quantify, quantify the MR. Okay, mm -hmm. she did not quantify the MR. Okay. She stated a severe MR, but... Uh, she, she has not quantified it. Uh, it should have been quantified with the vena contracta, LA volume index, and uh, other things. She should have quantified it. And uh, moderate pulmonary artery hypertension. Could you say some other causes of mitral stenosis? Because this AML, PML, thickened, uh, other causes of mitral, any other causes of mitral stenosis, you know? Congenital uh, mitral stenosis is there. So then calcific uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, then some uh, inherited conditions such as uh, Harler's Hunter's syndromes. Very good. Um, Carcinite syndrome, there will be a presence of mitral stenosis. And then lutum Becher syndromes, acquired uh, congenital AST with the uh, Acquired uh, MS. Very good, very good. Okay, okay, okay. So you have a case, in the echo findings are very clearly saying that the AML, PML is thick, thick and we say the VGS criteria for uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis. So uh, the yeah, PML mobility is restricted and the LA is dilated. Uh, and you have a MA by planimetry 1.5 and a mean gradient of 10 and 22. So all this put together, it, it is very clearly you can say, but you should have quantified the MR also uh, with the, some of the parameters. So it's a clear-cut case of rheumatic heart disease, senior mitral regurgitation and a moderate MS and uh, moderate tricuspid regurgitation and a moderate pulmonary artery hypertension. So how will you approach this uh, case? How will you treat this patient? Uh, since the patient presented the symptom at symptoms, sir, I would... Uh, have you got the next slide? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, therapeutics, uh, what was given for the patient? Uh, uh, for acute rheumatic fever, we have to go for prophylaxis. Uh, anti. Uh, put the drug anti chart that because from a medical point of view, we need to. You tell us the medical management of these patients. Yes. You go to the previous slide and uh, have the final diagnosis yes. and tell us the medical management. Then you tell us the surgical management of this okay. patient. Since patient had uh, presented with a recurrent rheumatic fever, we have to treat the recurrent rheumatic fever with anti-inflammatory drugs. So, uh, first, uh, NSAIDs uh, such as aspirin, in a high dose aspirin, we have to give a 50 to 70 mg per kg, we have to start and then we have to taper the dose. Um, then uh, patient, uh, we have to give secondary prophylaxis to prevent the recurrent uh, rheumatic fever attacks. For that, uh, we have to give injection benzathine, benzyl, benzathine uh, penicillins. Uh, How long will you advise this penicillin, penicillin or penicillin tablets? What so is the latest guideline says? Uh, according to WHO guidelines, uh, if the patient had a, a, a associated uh, with a residual carditis, we have to give lifelong prophylaxis. For this patient, we have to give lifelong prophylaxis. Why 21 days? Okay, just leave. Okay, no issues. If the patient is allergic to penicillin, what will be the alternate drug? You can give erythromycin to okay. so you said you said penicillin prophylaxis. What is the next drug of choice in this patient? Penicillin, benzyl penicillin or a penicillin B or erythromycin or clarithromycin. No, ma, that is okay. That is enough for next treatment of choice. Next treatment in this patient, will you choose a beta blocker or a dig 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 so for a patient, a patient present with the symptomatic uh, symptoms such as palpitation, chest pain, and then elevated uh, JVP, we have to uh, give uh, antidiuretics. 
Okay. Next. Beta blockers. Uh, Will you prefer digoxin in this patient? Why or is there an indication for digoxin or not? The patient doesn't have any uh, signs of uh, atrial fibrillation. So okay. What are, what are the other, other drugs? Other drugs. So beta blockers, pyrinolactone uh, for uh, ventricular remodeling. Uh, then. Uh, so suppose if this patient had an atrial fibrillation, how will you treat? Sir, uh, we have to give first rate control and rhythm control. Sir, for rate Very control, good. we have to give beta blockers. Uh, if it does not control, if the patient also had presented with the heart failure with atrial fibrillation, we have to add digoxin. Okay. What is the other drug we will you advise in this uh, atrial fibrillation patient? Therapamil or DTSM. Apart from that, to prevent uh, stroke? Uh, sir, uh, we can go for uh, anticoagulation therapy. BKS. We, uh, new, uh, oral anticoagulation, BK antagonists such as warfarin, acetromes. Okay. You are in your drug chart. So I have a question. You have a BP of only 90 bar 60. How would you go with the, um, I mean, diuretics? Um, uh, the patient, uh, we can start with low dose uh, tablet the last six months. Then more with the monitoring of BP and. Uh... There's one more statement where you have stated. What is the role of ACE inhibitors? Does this patient need ACE inhibitors? Uh, my patient had a LV uh, volume overload condition, which is leading to LV hypertrophy. So to prevent ventricular remodeling, we can add spinal relax. And there's also uh, one, put your uh, treatment because uh, it was a bit, uh, I mean, to see a combination of ACE inhibitors with spinal lactone. What is the problem with that? Would you like to go for both drugs? Hypotension. Number one. Then, then uh, AC inhibitors may lead to hyperkalemia. So the renal renal failure, it may worsen the renal failure of the patient. You have to be careful about the potassium levels as well. Potassium, hyperkalemia. Hmm. Okay. So, when is the plan for the surgical procedure and what is the surgical procedure that is planned? Is she the right candidate for a surgical procedure now? Yes, ma'am. Uh, patient had a grade 2 to grade 3 uh, NIHA classification breathlessness with the uh, severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, with both uh, mitral and uh, mitral regurgitation and mitral uh, stenosis is there. So, uh -huh. we have to go for mitral valve replacement in this patient. Sir, what do As she's a reproductive age female, we can go for uh, um, bioprosthetic uh, one. What are the prospects of, uh, I mean, uh, getting for conception and future course? She will definitely ask questions. People are now aware of all these things. Right. So, yeah. Pagala what would you advise her? meeting will come to the online meeting. I will come to the next one. I will come to the next one. I will come to the next one. Vital regurgitation is usually a... Uh, okay, sir. Uh, sure. right. Usually, uh, it won't... Um, uh, moderate mitral regurgitation, we can... Uh, Ask her to even um, you, we, we can ask her to. No, in this case, you are going to go for a surgical replacement of the bag. Question is, what are the prospects of going for uh, conception and the course of her um, delivery? How would you advise? She will ask all these questions will be asked for her regarding her future. She has. So, you're planning for, for a mitral valve replacement? Will you go for a metallic valve or a, any other valves are there? Because a young woman, what is the other alternative apart from a metallic valve? Bioprosthetic valve we can suggest for this patient, sir. Okay. Uh, what is the advantage of bioprosthetic valve? There is no need for anticoagulation, sir. Okay. What is the uh, disadvantage with the bioprosthetic valve? Sure. Lifespan for this uh, prosthetic valve around 10 years. Yeah, degeneration. So she might prepare valve. another surgery. So suppose she wants to have uh, marriage and pregnancy, no? bioprosthetic would be of a better choice. Okay. Uh, answer, ma'am. Uh, Mitral valve replacement surgery, we can uh, accept for regular follow-up, ma'am. Uh, okay. Specific. Apart from uh, mitral valve replacement, any other uh, treatment modality is available? What is PTMC? Percutaneous transcatheter mitral commissuratomy, we can go. Okay. If that is finally isolated MSN, we can go for PTMC, sir. 
very good she had associated mr we can we should go for mitral valve replacement okay Uh, we can ask for continued follow-up. Dr. Saramana, Dr. Nambirajan, sir, can we conclude? Because I think we'll be running short yes, of madam. time for the second yeah. case. We have to go for the next session also. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, Sashidra. Thank you. sir, thank you very much for all the contribution. Thank you. Thank you, sirs and madam. So the second case, Dr. Pasna. Okay, thank you, Madam. My signal is very weak. Uh, I'll... Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I understood. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. It's getting uh, suddenly uh, it gets off. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Pali oh, yeah. sir. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Chaykumar, Dr. Yeah, Saramana. Yeah, yeah. So do we start with the next case? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Please, please. Oh. Dr. Chaykumar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sir. I am this. Asna? Please go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, respected Professor and Unit Chief of uh, Department of General Medicine, Dr. Gita Ma'am. Uh, respected Associate Professor, Department of Thoracic Medicine, Dr. Jayakuma Sir. Other dignitaries of API, other professors and dear friends, good evening all. I'm Dr. Fasana, a final year postgraduate, Department of General Medicine, Coimbatore Metropolitan Hospital. And I'm here with the case of hybrid pneumothorax. Uh, this is the case of a 57-year-old male, Mr. X, a farmer by occupation, studied up to fourth standard, residing in Metapalayam, and he was brought to uh, outpatient department by his wife, with chief complaints of cough with expectation for a duration of six weeks prior to admission, fever for a duration of one week, and breathing difficulty for one month. This uh, 55-year-old male, uh, he was performing his routine activities and his job related activities without any difficulty until six weeks prior to admission. This patient's symptoms started with fever, which was high-grade, intermittent nature, not associated with chills, and initially took some medication and subsided with medication in one week. This fever was associated with productive cough for a total duration of six weeks. Initially, it was mucoid and scanty. Later, it became mucocorrelin and cow smelling, and he had around 30 ml of sweat per day. It was not associated in a dialogue or postural variation, not associated with any cases. Can you name conditions where there can be diurnal variation of cough? In diurnal, we have seen in conditions like gastroesophageal reflux disease, where patient will develop cough during night. And or asthma as well, ma'am, where patient can have a uh, uh, cough during morning as well as night, ma'am. And patient with orthopnea, and patient with cardiac diseases, where patient develop breathlessness, uh, cough during uh, night time, ma'am, while lying down. Similarly, for cough and postural variation, give me examples. Cough with the postural variations are seen in cases like bronchi cases, lung abscess, and uh, empyema. Which posture? Which but, posture? Enhances cough in bronchic tasses. The patient will have a cough when lying on opposite side of the pathology. Mode. So, cough with mucobronchus, bronchial so? variation indicate unilateral or bilateral disease? Mode. Indicate unilateral, sir, if it is postural variation. Okay, in case of left lung pathology, what history you will get it from the patient? A patient will have. Uh, Sir, patient will have. Uh, Hi, more, am I uh, audible? Yes, yes sir. sir. Good evening, uh, sir. Told 30 ml per day mucopurulent foul smelling sputum. Yes, sir. Is it scanty or small quantity? Sir, it is not scanty, sir. Initially, it was scanty, sir. Later, it was 30 ml per day, sir. So it should be like that. Huh? But it doesn't make much difference, but small quantity sputum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scanty indicative of COPD, bronchitis. Bronchitis. Huh? 
சரியா ஓகே எஸ் சார் வாட் இஸ் ப்ரோங்கோரியமா ப்ரோங்கோரியஸ் மோர் தென் 100 ml ஆஃப் ஸ்பியூட்டம் per day எஸ் வாட் ஆர் தி கண்டிஷன் யூ கெட் ப்ரோங்கோரியா சோ ஒன் இஸ் ப்ரோங்கிக் டேசஸ் லங் அப்சஸ் OPC poisoning and uh, bronco uh, alveolar cell carcinoma okay okay go on so in this cough it mm-hmm. the cough with expectation was also associated with left side chest pain yep, which was okay, ma'am. pricking ma'am it Pricking's was pricking type oh, okay ma'am it was pricking type aggravated by deep inspiration and cough and relieved on lying on left side with no radiation of pain pain also subsided in 3 to 4 days during yeah, the course of illness shall we call it as pleuritic pain yes ma'am pleuritic pain oh. during Despite the course of illness, pain yeah uh, it's a pricking catchy type of pain usually felt on lateral aspect of chest which is aggravated by deep yeah, inspiration pricking and cough or catchy type you see it is catchy or a stabbing type of pain okay stabbing type of pain. yes aggravated by deep inspiration cough yeah. why why it's aggravated by inspiration and cough ma uh, because uh, this pain is because of the inflamed parietal pleura sir so de- during deep inspiration this parietal pleura will get rubbed against the visceral pleura which make it uh, which make the pain Uh, more sir during inspiration usually in case of effusion initially pleuritic pain is there once effusion is developed developed now it will disappear sir subside oh, oh. So this, uh, this in this patient be... also mm-hmm. pain subside mm-hmm. in 3 to 4 days sir yeah okay. during the course of illness patient also developed breathing, breathing difficulty uh, that progressed from mmrc grade 1 to grade 2 in first 10 days he developed breathlessness on climbing stairs and he stopped going for his work due to shortness of breath initially it was not associated with orthopnea or uh, proximal nocturnal dyspnea it was aggravated by lying on right lateral position after 14 days of onset of his symptoms he underwent further imaging and was referred to coimbatore medical college hospital and after admission some chest tube was inserted on left side and drained around 500 ml of pale yellow colored fluid with some uh, with treatment of oxygen and iv injection he symptomatically improved but on fourth day of admission uh, because of some personal reason he was discharged against medical advice after removing chest tube but at home uh, he continued to have cough and mucopenal expectation now its quantity increased it was around 50 to 80 ml of phlegm every day which was foul smelling and which was more when lying on right lateral position with no diurnal variation and not associated with hemoptysis During the same time, his breathlessness also worsened from MMRC grade two to grade four in one month. He was homebound and was unable to do daily activities like bathing. Patient preferred lying on right, left, left lateral position during this time. No history of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea at this time. History of loss of weight around ten kilogram was present in six weeks. He had history of loss of appetite. No history of swelling of feet, decreased urine output, abdominal distension, yellow discoloration of eyes and urine, puffiness of face or palpitation. No history of any dysphagia or hoarseness of voice. Past history. No past history of diabetes mellitus, system hypertension, bronchial asthma, allergy, tuberculosis, epilepsy, coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular accident. They have taken two doses of COVID vaccine. No history of any recurrent pulmonary infection. personal history uh, he have regular bowel and bladder habits uh, for last month one month he have uh, decreased appetite and disturbed sleep he consumes mixer diet uh, he is a chronic smoker with a pack year of 15 and smoking index of 300 he consumes alcohol occasionally family history his mother had sputum positive tuberculosis 20 years back he completed att no history of any malignancy in family social history he belongs to low socio economic background according to modified kutusami scale and he is living with his wife in a single story house summary a 57 year old male chronic smoker with history of contact with tuberculosis presented with complaints of fever cough with a foul smelling mucopenal expectoration and breathlessness with pleuritic chest pain 
in the process tube drained yellow colored fluid which was partially treated later presented with worsening of symptoms and gradually progressive breathlessness over one month with history of significant loss of weight and appetite <clears throat> so with this history yeah 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 tell me so with this history uh, these were the differential diagnosis that i initially thought of first one is pulmonary tuberculosis in our indian settings any cough with more than 2 weeks we have we have to consider presumptive tb so history of uh, cough with expectation for 6 weeks with a history of significant weight loss and loss of appetite with history of contact with tuberculosis it favor diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis but uh, the history not favoring it is not any associated any evening loss of temperature No, and no. Uh, say evening i would like to just confer with uh, dr jay kumar as well how many cases of uh, tuberculosis we see with evening rise of temperature it's not necessary that it is not like history not favoring would you agree with that dr jay kumar yes ma'am yes ma'am see is mandatory that you should have evening rise of temperature to justify tuberculosis no oh, ma'am most of the time patient having this history with the night sweat on like that but most of them patient will on antipyretic these type of symptoms will mask in most of the time yeah yeah so to say that history not favoring i think may not be right no okay okay the second differential that i can differentiate that i Uh, any other uh, bacterial pneumonia other than tuberculosis with cinematic accretion as patient had a history of uh, yellow colored fluid in icd session and for fever cough with expectoration patient could have any uh, pneumonia other than tb with cinematic accretion and third possibility malignancy with a history of chronic smoker significant weight loss and symptom was not resolved with the initial treatment could have malignancy as well But history not favoring is in usually malignant effusion patient will have uh, hemorrhagic effusion. But here patient had clear yellow colored fluid which most suggestive of pus. By end of the history taking, whether you are dealing with unilateral lung disease or bilateral pus. Uh, unilateral lung disease. Which side? Unilateral lung disease, sir. Which is yeah. left sided, sir. Because uh, patient. patient had plantipnea and increased expectation sir yeah whether you are dealing with infective case or non infective one like in uh, more close. likely infective sir symptom started with fever sir okay so you can still have a bilateral disease of course the predominant symptoms are on the left side but when somebody yes, is having sir. cough with expectation there is nothing to say that there need not be findings on the right side isn't it So I think yes. you can very well say that there is a bilateral disease, but then the predominant uh, symptoms are on the left side. I think that should be the better way because if you are going to have a pulmonary tuberculosis or uh, uh, tuberculosis, you can find uh, lesions on both sides. But, uh, yes, with pathology yes. more on left side with the history. Whether it's a dealing with infective cause or non-infective, like malignancy. If it is it infective, means history suggests you have TB. Is T M or non T B? Sir, uh, more likely infective, sir. Fever, cough, with expectation, with the mucoporous sputum, sir. Uh, because of the, because duration is more than six weeks, they and with contact history of T B, we have to think of the pulmonary tuberculosis in our Indian settings as first differential diagnosis, sir. Okay. What are the history against of? Um, Non tuberculous details, infective, but it's not tuberculous. Uh, sir, uh, the symptom is sir. It is uh, more than it is around six weeks. Patient is having the symptoms, sir. I, I see. No, no. I think the question was different, now, Jai Kumar. What is the question? Yeah, uh, based on the history, you are dealing with sir tuberculous details. Is whether it's tuberculosis or non tuberculosis, like protein uh, lung abscess or like that. Uh, duration based on the duration. Uh, based TB. on duration, it looks like more on TB, sir, because he had symptoms which was six weeks, sir. But since it was partially treated, we cannot uh, uh, say that it is it could it need, need not be bacterial pneumonia as well, because patient might have double res developed resistance because of this partial treatment as well. So it could be TB or uh, could be lung abscess as well, sir. Okay. 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 Moving to examination, 
on general examination patient was conscious cooperative oriented in time place and person and was febrile he was dyspneic and tachycardic at rest and preferred to sit he was thin built and ill nourished his weight okay. was 40 kg okay. sir dyspneic tachycardic at rest preferred to sit means preferred to sit sir position yes sir he is having orthopnea as well lying down he has uh, orthopnea as well because of the uh, is in fact is pathology pain but you have already mentioned that he had a preference to lie to the right so if there was yes, no mention of orthopnea all along yes ma'am yeah. hmm. uh, he he had orthopnea and breathlessness on lying on left side ma'am okay, your exam uh, is going to be only in a sitting posture yes ma'am hello yeah yeah oh. he has a preference to lie towards the right that is because his pathology is on the left yes ma'am so uh, while this sleeping is orthopnea ma'am while sleeping he preferred to lie on right side ma'am uh, because he is having difficulty in lying on uh, supine as well as lying on uh, left lateral posture because of the pathology ma'am okay and he was a uh, thin uh, he was thin built and ill nourished with weight of 40 kg and height of 168 cm and bmi was 14.6 kg per meter square on physical examination he had pallor and grade 2 pan digital clubbing he uh, doesn't have any icterus cyanosis generalized lymphadenopathy or periledema <laughs> on head to foot examination he had nicotine staining on inner aspect of teeth He uses no, it's all part of must... general examination. You need not separate it out as head to foot. Everything is part and parcel of general yes. examination. Yes, continue. Okay. He uses accessory muscles of respiration. JVP not elevated. No external markers of tuberculosis. No external markers of malignancy. His vitals. What are the external has... markers of malignancy? Uh, for uh, for yes, what malignancy. What are the external markers of malignancy? For lung malignancy, tosses and meiosis as a part of Pankow's tumor. Any hoarseness of voice while speaking. Any hard lymph node, especially scaly lymph node, right as well as left to supraclavicular lymph node. Uh, wastage of uh, wasting of uh, muscles of uh, hand on thinner and uh, hypothenar eminence. Okay. Any uh, 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 so superficial thrombophlebitis, uh, SVC obstruction, uh, right. non-pulsing. Continue. Continue. Okay. His vitals pulsate was ninety beats per minute, regular rhythm, normal volume, no specific character, no radio radial or radial femoral delay. Condition of vessel was normal, felt equally in all pal palpable peripheral pulses. His blood pressure was hundred bar seventy millimeters of mercury in left arm in sitting position. His respiratory rate was twenty six per minute, which was abdominal thoracic type, and oxygen saturation was ninety one percent in room air and temperature of ninety eight point degree Fahrenheit. System examination. Examination of upper respiratory tract. There were no deviation deviation of nasal septum, no nasal discharge, no nasal polyp or paranasal sinus tendinosus. Oral cavity and oropharynx showed poor oral hygiene with the dental caries. No tonsillitis, no post nasal drip or congestion of posterior pharyngeal wall. Do you see post nasal drip? Is it post nasal drip can be seen in the upper respiratory tract examination? Uh, ma'am, in posterior pharyngeal wall. It is a symptom. Oh, okay. You see a post nasal drip. Okay. No, I don't think you have to write things that uh, really don't uh, are not relevant or which you cannot see. Yes, please continue. Examination of lower respiratory tract. On inspection, trachea appears to be shifted to left side with positive trail side on trail sign on left side. Epicalimbus visualized in left fifth intercostal space, five centimeter medial to midclavicular line. Chest wall is asymmetrical with bulging over left mammary area. Fullness noticed in left lower intercostal space, and crowding of ribs in left upper four intercostal spaces. Left supraclavicular hollowing was present. See the left mammary. Yes. You are telling about left yes. mammary and the following areas. 
So are you seeing a separate bulge over the left mammary and then a fullness? How do you differentiate bulging and fullness? See, these two areas are in continuum. Left mammary yes, followed by the left lower intercostal spaces. Yes, ma'am. So, bulging in you... both areas. Uh -huh. Yes. So, do you see separate bulges over these two areas, or in general, you are going to talk of a fullness? Was fullness, ma'am, in left mammary as well as in left lower in the causal space? I think you can just generally tell it as, or you could have had a, mm. I mean, a photo of the patient to demonstrate if there there is an exclusive bulging, isn't it? Yes. So you would like to say that there is crowding of the left upper intercostal spaces yes, and there is a fullness in the lower intercostal lower, spaces, yes, lower area. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes. And he had left supraclavicular hollowing. Chest wall movement decreased in left hemithorax. Typhus is present. Drooping of shoulder present on left side. A scar of 1 into 0.5 centimeter in mid axillary line on left, inter left fifth intercostal space. No dilated tortuous vein, discharging sinuses or pulsation. On palpation, trachea shifted to left side. Define trail the, sign. Trail sign is the undue prominence of sternocleidomastoid muscle on the side where trachea is deviated. The undue prominence of the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid. Head of yes, ma'am. Yes. On palpation, trachea is shifted to left side. Epicolumbal felt in left to fifth intercostal space, 5 cm medial to midclavicular line. Movement of chest is decreased over left hemithorax. Mm. Crowding of ribs present in left upper four ribs. Chest circumference on expiration was 81 cm and on inspiration 83 cm with chest expansion of 2 cm. And left hemithorax, diameter on inspiration 42, expiration 41.5 cm with an expansion of 0.5 cm on left side. And on right side, on inspiration 41 cm, expiration 39.5 cm with an expansion of 1.5 cm. Andropostal diameter was 15 and transverse diameter was, uh, was uh, uh, 26. Spinoscapular distance on left side, it was 9 and on right side was 7 cm. Vocal fremitus normal on right side, decreased in over left to supraclavicular and left to sub suprascapular area and absent on all other areas on left side. Tacular fremitus absent, no subcutaneous emphysema, intercostal tenderness or any warmth. On percussion, direct clavicular percussion, impaired note on left side and normal resonant note on right side. On percussion of lung area, resonant note is heard over all uh, areas on right side. Impaired note heard over supraclavicular and suprascapular area on left side. And a hyper resonant note over infraclavicular area on left side. All other areas on left side showed stony dullness on percussion. Uh, on percussion, prop space was dull. On tidal percussion, liver dullness felt at a fifth intercostal space in right midclavicular line that became so what resonant. What is the reason on for the tidal percussion? Tidal tell percussion me, tell us dull. how do you do a tidal percussion first? Um, patient in a sitting position, we have to start percussing from second intercostal space in midclavicular line downwards. So, then on and, the anterior uh, aspect or the posterior aspect? Anterior aspect, ma'am, in midclavicular line, ma'am. I would and just like to get... confer with uh, Dr. Jay Kumar. Is it on the anterior aspect or is it on the posterior aspect, Dr. Jay Kumar? Actually, a recent textbook says posterior aspect uh, from uh, above down. Yeah. Uh, uh. You dull note, ask, uh, uh, keep the finger like that and ask the patient to take a deep inspiration. And yeah. again, it will become resonant. Okay. You should two, four centimeter of uh, width of uh, dull note will become resonant when yeah, diaphragm is yeah. not be done both sides. In this Posterior. patient with the right side showing normal resonance throughout, was it needed to undertake a tidal percussion? Does it contribute? No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We are having some effusion. Uh, we are suspecting some pleural effusion on uh, right side, ma'am. So left side, ma'am. So if uh, I would like to know whether patients are having any bilateral pathology in effusion in right side as well, ma'am. In that case, tidal percussion will get dullness. But please refer. I think you'll have to get your, uh, I mean, methodology right. Because I think as per the latest uh, guidelines, you have to do on the posterior okay. aspect. Okay. Because okay. want to know. 
okay then okay. then uh on chronic isthmus a band of resonance of 5 cm got on right side and 2 cm on left side what are the anatomical boundaries of the chronic isthmus uh, medially by scalene muscle anterior by anterior by clavicle posterior by trapezius and on laterally by acromion process of scapula yes okay good indicate left side 2 cm means uh because patient is having some pathology in left side usually you get a band of resonance of around 5 to 7 cm in percussive chronic isthmus a triangle so patient is having a uh, band of resonance of 2 cm in left side which indicates some pathology in uh, left side uh, which could be either fibrosis collapse or anything oh. on auscultation a uh, normal vestibular uh, sound that's not heard over right hemithorax degree sare in left supraclavicular as well as suprascapular area and absent air sound in all other areas of left side a fine inspiratory crepitation heard over left supraclavicular and suprascapular areas vocal resonance normal on right side decrease over left supraclavicular suprascapular area and absent on all other areas on left side Special test. A uh, straight line dermis was caused even left to fourth in the cross okay. space, where yes. we can demarcate an area of hyperresonance as well as dermis in a straight line manner. On doing point test, a sound of bell heard over left to third in the cross space. Succussion splash was present on left to third in the cross space. Shifting dermis was present. a uh, dalna se left to fourth in the cross space which became resonant on right la right lateral position and the dalna re uh, reappear when patient sits and stasis was also positive but we had the patient had an increase in intensity of sound over left intraclavicular area okay among these uh, okay kekda yes sorry okay. yeah yeah the scratch test is more specific for which pneumothorax or hydromethorax ma hydronimotorax sir because we can differentiate the intensity of sound going from oh, wind to uh, air sound when the uh, air air level what sound you will heard in the fluid level okay. in the scratch so in the scratch test in the air column irukra edala louder when the ah, fluid yes. column irukra totally reduced or absent compared to others how okay, will you do this this ma sir scratch test how will you perform uh, first we have to find out the area of the uh, straight line dermis and put the stethoscope over the uh, area of the uh, 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 hyperresonant and dull area and start uh, uh, stroking the skin over the chest starting from the uh, below upwards sir a change in intensity of sound will be heard sir when uh, uh, stroking reaches to area of uh, hyperresonant that may be one one it all the uh, keep the diaphragm of the stethoscope over the vertebral column scratch eq distance from the diaphragm uh, scratch simultaneously so when the air column the pneumothorax part will have louder sound suppose if you get it in the lower part na, the fluid area will have reduced sound or absent sound this is uh, most specific clinical examination in i don't know. hydrodynamics yeah uh, other system examination uh, cardiovascular system uh, apical impulse felt in left fifth in the cross space 5 cm middle to mid clavicular line first and second heart sound was heard no added sound abdominal examination and nerve system examination was clinically normal coming to summary examination of the pundus was done optic pundus No, ma'am. Because patient was having cough with expectation suspected TB, ma'am. It's not turned at the time. Uh, it is not generally given as an excuse. Optic fundus. You, I think, as a postgraduate student, you must um, yes. mention. You have to examine and you have to mention. Yes. Uh, only then that completes your examination. Okay. Okay. Ocular findings, eye finding, tuberculosis. What are the things? Uh, eye finding one is uh, flicted, sir. Which is seen in sclera. Uh, then uh, coronary tubercle, which is seen in miliary tuberculosis. Miliary tuberculosis, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, to summarize, 
57 year old male a chronic smoker with history of contact with tuberculosis presented with fever cough with a foul smelling mucopenal expectoration with a history of drainage of yellow color fluid from chest tube partially treated later presented with worsening of symptoms uh, a gradually progressive breathlessness of one month with significant weight loss on examination patient had palpable and clubbing features of volume loss in left upper lung areas bulging endocardial fullness in uh, lower lung areas with the lower media sternum shifted to opposite side with absent breath sound and stoned dullness on percussion lower lung zone with uh, positive straight line dullness shifting dullness and pointers so with this uh, history the clinical diagnosis uh, that i concluded was left sided hydronephritis probably usually do the ps test no what clinical finding uh, which will எதை வச்சு நீங்க ஹவில் ப்ரொசீட் வித் ஃபைவ் இயர்ஸ் டெஸ்ட்மா யூஸ்வலா இன் கேஸ் ஆஃப் ப்ளூர் லெஃபிஷன் யூ இல் நாட் டன் ஃபைவ் இயர்ஸ் திஸ் எஸ் சார் யூஸ்வலி இன் ப்ளூர் லெஃபிஷன் பேஷன்ட் வில் நாட் வான் பி கெட்டிங் எனி ஸ்ட்ரெயிட் லைன் டல்னஸ் சார் बिकॉज ஆஃப் தி बिकॉज ஆஃப் தி ஆக்சிலரி அப்ஸ்ட்ராக் ஆஃப் தி ஃப்ளூயிட் வில் வி வான் பி கெட்டிங் எ ஸ்ட்ரெயிட் லைன் டல்னஸ் சோ இஃப் யூ ஆர் ஏபிள் டு கெட் ஸ்ட்ரெயிட் லைன் டல்னஸ் வித் அ நேரியா ஆஃப் ஹைப்பர் ரெசனன்ட் எபோ அண்ட் ஸ்டோன் டல்னஸ் பிலோ वी கேன் ப்ரொசீட் வித் ஃபர்தர் ஸ்பெஷல் டெஸ்ட் ஃபார் ஹைட்ரோனியோமோதரக்ஸ் சார் okay so yeah, these are this were the uh, differential diagnosis at the end of uh, examination uh, left side hydronephrotax first possibility in etiology probably due to tuberculosis with left upper lobe fibrosis with evidence of tracheal uh, uh, shift uh, and uh, okay, just tell the clinical diagnosis uh, okay. only the diagnosis and then if you want to get it second possibility uh, bacterial pneumonia other than tuberculosis with syn pneumonic effusion maybe any gas forming organism which is leading into hydronephrotax or because of previous uh, intercostal drainage leading to hydronephrotax and third possibility left upper lobe mass with collapse and malignant pleural effusion with this uh, and patient in respiratory failure defined respiratory failure i uh, yes ma'am uh, patient have use of acts Now, uh, patient of use of accessory muscles of respiration. He, saturation was uh, 91% in room air, and he was dysmic and tachyonic. With this, uh, we with this evidence, patient was in respiratory failure. Okay. Smoker. Any other additional diagnosis you want to add? Smoker, sir. COPD like that. Uh, COPD with acute infective exacerbation. But uh, AP dimension versus transverse dimension is not uh, yes, in any. It was, uh, it was more on flat chest, sir, which was more uh, contributed to TB. Of course, as sir has told, because he's a chronic smoker with a high smoking index, you have to consider. But uh, clinically, we do not have any evidence in terms of the dimensions of the chest wall, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. and there is no past history suggestive of, of, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease yes ma'am okay how will you yeah yeah so uh, proceeded with uh, blood investigations cbc to look for uh, wbc whether it is uh, increased and with differential count for this patient wbc was 18000 at the time of admission with a differential count more on polymorphic cells which was 87 percentage ESR and CRP was elevated other uh, LFT RFT RFT was normal and he also had uh, AG reversal as well his sputum AFB and CB net was negative uh, this was the chest x-ray of patient uh, which is uh, showing a hyperlucency in left upper zone a homogeneous soft tissue density in left to middle and lower zone with a blunting of postophrenic as well as cardiophrenic angle with an air fluid level His trachea was deviated to left side, and there is crowding of rib uh, over left upper zone. Cardiac shadow also sh- uh, shifted to right side. Okay, what are the other causes for um, cavity with the uh, air fluid level? Uh, uh, any uh, uh, cavity thing, lung lung malignancy, any lung abscess. Uh, any bullae with a secondary infection or any uh, rupture of uh, bullae with a secondary infection uh, or bronchopleural fistula 
and also uh, traumatic injury yeah. what are the clinical finding you'll get in at the level of pleural effusion uh, at the level of pleural effusion there will be bronchial breath sound and uh, cardiac resonance just above the level of pleural effusion what are the pleural fluid tap findings yes ma'am Uh, pleural tap analysis showed pro, uh, elevated protein, which was three point eight gram, with LDH more than thousand two hundred ma'am, and cells was predominantly polymorphic, polymorphic nucleolytic lipocytes ma'am. So, what is the macroscopic uh, picture of the pleural fluid? It was uh, predominantly uh, neutrophils ma'am. No, no, no. Poly- On appearance, appearance uh, of the pleural fluid. It was a uh, pale yellow color ma'am. So this was the first, first time, or after first. he was admitted, and when you had his uh, after admitting, again, yes, hmm. I feel he was again put, ma'am. That also showed Frank first, ma'am, with foul smelling. So when there is Frank first, you would like to call it as a pyoneumothorax. Yes, ma'am, pyoneumothorax. Okay. Sugar, hello, ma'am. Sugar, thirty-eight gram per deciliter, sir. Okay, low sugar value indicate. What are the condition you will get? Low sugar value in pleural fluid. Usually uh, more than six is normal. Yes, Less than six yes. is value. What are the condition you will get? Low sugar value. Uh, Cinematic effusion, sir. Uh, tuberculosis, rheumatoid arthritis, yeah. uh, and malignancy as well, sir. Yeah. yeah, low glucose level indicate you have to do ICD. ICD indication to... for ICD. ICD indication for ICD. And low sugar yes, value indicates prognosis in malignant pleural effusion. Okay, sir. Okay. See, pleural for CBN and AFD was also negative, and ADA was fine. Okay, LDH. Ah, thousand two hundred, sir. Okay, okay. It is. Ah, uh, what are the classes you will get? High LDH in pleural fluid, more than three times of upper uh, limit. Ah, cinematic. Uh, cinematic effusion, sir. Mm, hemorrhagic effusion and also in malignancy sir along with parasitic lung and the lung infection also you get empyema complicated paraneumonic effusion rheumatoid parasitic infection yeah okay sir i just have a doubt yes. dr jay kumar when there is so when there it is purulent when it is pyoneumothorax uh, you th- uh, still will you get uh, succussion splash and all those things because it gets thicker the fluid gets so much thicker Actually, when the up, uh, air crapple happen, man. So, uh, pleura is uh, lung is totally collapsed. Pleural space is wide open. So, fluid with uh, pus, whether it's a uh, blood or uh, hemothorax, mm-hmm. still or, you can have this sufficient flush. Okay, okay. And uh, this patient pleural for culture and sensitivity showed Escherichia coli, which was resistant to uh, gentamicin. Ciprofloxacin, cefotaxin, piptas, piptasin, as well as meropenem. No, this resp- responsive to what? Uh, amikacin. To? Okay. Amikacin. And his a CT chest showed left hydronemothorax with air fluid level with the visceral pleural thickening and left lower lobe consolidation. And he was further managed with intercostal drainage, IV antibiotics, and was further taken up for decot. Uh, with ICD, what are the complications you will expect patient with hydronephritis with ICD? Uh, sir, uh, sir, bronchopleural fistula, sir. And uh, what common complication you will expect? Uh, bronchopleural fistula and a trapped lung due to fibrosis. Uh, yeah. The lung won't expand, sir, even after ICD and drainage of pus. And also yep. pleural thickening, which will also cause some restrictive uh, pattern of uh, uh, respiratory failure. And other so, patient can go for sepsis. Complication. Uh, when will you say bronchopleural fistula? What is the difference between bronchopleural fistula and alveolar pleural fistula? Sir, uh, bronchopleural fistula is the uh, connection between airway and uh, pleural space above proximal to segmental bronchi. But alveolar fistula is distal to segmental bronchi, and yeah. uh, bronchopleural fistula is we have to do surgical intervention. But in alveolar fistula, we can uh, we can uh, control with uh, uh, treating infections. Sir. Okay. 
yeah antibodies in this case let's put okay. al root alveolar pleural cluster because probably patient have some lung, lung abscess that uh, rupture into pleural space uh, leading to hydronemothorax what are the types of ablation you will know with icd uh, uh, sir uh, in both inspiration and expiration sir continuous uh, air leak sir in both inspiration as well as expiration which is seen in bronco pleural fistula then only during inspiration which is also seen in bronco pleural fistula during expiration uh, which is seen in alveolar pleural fistula and during deep expiration deep inspiration which is seen also seen in alveolar pleural fistula post expiration it's not a deep post expiration post expiration mm -hmm. Have you ruled out tuberculosis here, ma'am? Ah, uh, uh, yes, ma'am. With the investigation and all, we couldn't uh, get any findings. Sportum was undertaken. Sportum was evaluated. Yes, ma'am. It was uh -huh. negative, ma'am. It was negative for uh, AFB as well as CBNAT, and AD was also ten. Because CBNAT has a very small percentage of positivity on it, only around forty percent or so. So, what is the yeah. there is still a likelihood because there is a history of tuberculosis in his family, mm -hmm. his mother. So, and patient also had upper lobe fibrosis. Mm -hmm. There is also upper lobe fibrosis. So, still there is a possibility that there can be a tuberculosis angle to this, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. What are the complications of hydronemothorax if you are not treated? Sir, the bronchial fluorosis. No, not treated. No treated patient. Uh, a, a patient can go for sepsis. Mm, yeah. So any complication will be more. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Is the patient on follow? Ah uh, yes, ma'am. He uh, this month only he underwent decortication pneumonectomy, ma'am. So yes, underwent yeah, decortication pneumonectomy. Yes, ma'am. So, what are the problems or what are the complications he can have in future following decortication of pneumonectomy? Uh, uh, respiratory failure, ma'am, because patient uh, because of uh, decompensated lung, ma'am. Uh, uh, so, you have to advise smoking cessation advice also. It's very, very yes, important. Okay. Give other so, hmm? Dr. Fasna, sir, this is a very basic question to you. In your patient, the material was showing sensitivity to only to, I think, amikacin. That's what you mentioned. Yes, Remaining sir. every drug is resistant. Do you think yes. if you're going to start the patient on amikacin, is going to work out? So, which type of form is you are dealing with in this patient, doctor? Uh, this is a gram-negative fluid. Sorry. With the organism which is resistant to your quinolones, almost yes, all types of aminoglycosides, even though amikacin is in vitro sensitive, it may not be in vivo sensitive, and yes, patient sir. is also or organism also resistant to carbapenem. Yes, sir. Right. So yes, the sir. patient is having definitely extended spectrum that beta lactamase uh, organism along with carbapenem resistance, CRE. Yes, sir. Do you think that uh, you need to stop with? Uh, starting the patient on amikacin, or do you want to pursue something else? The amikacin penetration to pleural space won't be much, sir. No, in a type of person, patients like this or basic uh, organism like this, if the amikacin is alone, since it is remaining all anti, I mean, sorry, antibiotics of aminoglycoside group is resistant, less likely to be in vivo sensitive. Oh, okay. Understand? So in that case. And patient is also or organism also resistant to carbapenem. Yes, sir. So go for ideal to go for carbapenem or carbo R test. Go for the carbo R test to find R out test. what yeah, what is the which type of uh, mutation is happening in that uh, organism to produce this carbapenem resistant. When you have an organism of ESBL, when you have an organism of AMTC, or if you have an organism of the carbapenem resistant enterobacteria or whatever the negative gram negative infections always to go for and considering the CRE is one of the most virulent form of or most resistant form of organism mm -hmm. better to go for carbo or test to find out is the NDM pattern of mutation or something else is mm -hmm. happening. Yes, sir. 
okay so that is very important for you to choose the antibiotic instead of relying on in vitro sensitivity just a small practical point for you you cannot start with medication in this patient straight away okay sir is other clinical points they have been discussing extensively i don't want to interfere with that being important clinical practical point okay sir Thank you, sir. Some yeah, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Madam, uh, can we? Madam, yes, can sir, we close, can we close the session, madam? Yeah, we okay. can close. Thank you, sir. Madam, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Jay Kumar. Jay Kumar, sir, and uh, Prambiranjan, sir, and Sivak Kumar, sir, also in between join. Thank you, everyone of you, for this uh, wonderful discussion, and appreciate both the postgraduates, uh, Dr. Sachitra and Fasna, for wonderful presentation as well as discussion as well. Thank you, everyone of you, and good night to all of you. Thank you, sir, and good night. Good night. Ah, das muss ich können.